So I'm Chris Zorich, and on today's show, we have Notre Dame alum, former president and vice chair of NetApp, and an expert lecturer on leadership and culture, Tom Mendoza. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely. Um, and on this part, we would show your intro, but I'm a little nervous now. I don't want to lose <laughs> you, so we're going to skip that part. Um, this is exciting for me because I have a chance to interview someone that I think has made a great impression, not only in business, but on every community that you touch. And understanding that you may know more about Notre Dame football than I do, <laughs> yeah. which um, I'm kind of jealous about, but we, we will also get into that. We have a lot to cover, but um, first I'd like to talk about kind of your, your journey to Notre Dame. Sure. Um, when we first talked a long time ago, um, your story is fascinating. So can you just share to our audience um, about kind of how you got to Notre Dame? Sure. You know, it's, it's funny because I know how competitive it is to get in Notre Dame today. It's incredibly hard to get in Notre Dame. And people grow up, that's their life dream is to go there. Well, I grew up Protestant on Long Island. My parents <laughs> have sixth grade educations. Uh, my dad enlisted in World War II at 16. He was fought in the Pacific for four years. Uh, but I'm just saying, I didn't come from a family or a neighborhood where kids went to college. Okay. Or parents that had gone to college. It was more like you got out of high school and got a job. And so my dad told my brother and I, you got to get scholarships. If you're going to go to college, you know, we don't have the money. And my brother was a baseball player. He was drafted in the second round by the Phillies. And I, I wrestled. And so that was my ticket to go. And so I focused on wrestling schools. Okay. You know, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Iowa State at the time. Dan Gable was there. And I uh, was fortunate to get a scholarships to those places. And I got injured in a match. It was I, I tried to do international wrestling. My coach thought it was a good idea. It was not. <laughs> <laughs> As it turned out. <laughs> and uh, I, got, I get injured. And all those... Going back in time, they used to have a thing called telex. People don't even know what that is, but it just they telex to the room in the hospital and say, "Oh, just to be sure you understand, it's only a one-year scholarship." I'm like, "You're well, kidding that, me!" That never came up before. <laughs> and this older guy walked in the room, and I'm thinking, "Who in the hell is this?" I just kind of goes walking in. What now? And he said, "I was at the match, and my name's Tom Fallon. I'm the wrestling coach at Notre Dame. And my father was Catholic. My mother was Protestant." Okay. The nuns came to the house to complain when I was a kid because we weren't going to Catholic school. And my, they laid into my father. And then my father laid into my mother. She stayed very calm. And she said, no problem. You take them every Sunday. Never came up again. Wow. <laughs> my dad played fast pitch softball on Sundays. It wasn't coming up. So anyway, uh, he said, look, I don't, because I finished the match, even though I took a pretty bad injury. Okay. And he said to me, uh, I don't know if you can get into Notre Dame, but if you can, I have one scholarship to give. We're just starting a program. And I'll give it to you. And I said to him, you know, they just told me I'll probably never wrestle again. They oh, my just gosh. Told me and my dad that. It's the only time I saw my dad cry. Wow. And uh, he said, I figured that, but we'll take a chance. If it doesn't, you know, we'll, you know, we'll keep you on scholarship for two years. And if, if you can't wrestle, we'll put you on. We'll help you with loans. And that is wow. exactly, and that's what happened. So it was completely by happenstance but it obviously had an amazing impact on my life and uh, i appreciated everything from then on i didn't know what i was walking into i didn't know when i went it was all male and co-ed the year right i did not know that when i showed up <laughs> <laughs> Talk about not a lot of research here, hey they offered a scholarship why not you know yeah. i didn't know what state it was in it was you know not so today. during that time um, you've had some, some some interesting experiences, at least on the football field. I mean, it, it's it, you were a freshman in '69, right? 
Yeah, that was the first year that Notre Dame went to a bowl since 1925. Wow. People don't know that Notre Dame was the original Rose Bowl game was Notre Dame played Stanford. Wow. And then they decided that it interfered with finals. We're not going to bowls anymore. And so in 1969, uh, they, they figured out they could move finals. What a thought. <laughs> wow. wow. And they and they said, we're going to go to a bowl. So your first bowl happened to be my freshman year. Eric Parsegian was the coach. And they played undefeated, untied Texas, uh, who was number one. And Notre Dame lost in the last minute, led by Joe Theismann. My sophomore year, they were still undefeated, untied number one. And Notre Dame okay. went down and took them out. 24 to 11 with Joe Thayer. Wow. Now, th that was the... The Cotton Bowl. That was, okay, okay. Was that the pass? The, 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 the pass? No, no, that was Tom Clemens. So, so but your first two years, you played number one, right? And then your junior year, uh, Nebraska was the powerhouse. And Alabama had lost, I think, four or five bowls in a row. And Bear Bryant chose not to play them. And he went to the Cotton Bowl. They call it the Chicken Bowl because he wouldn't play. Enough. You're and kidding Dame, me. Which was a just, I think we were nine and two. We were good, but we didn't belong in that game. And it showed. We got oh, my God. The opening play of the game, Johnny Rogers went through an open hole up for about 70 yards. And it was like Moses in the seas. It was like, what are we doing here? It was an annihilation. But that same group of kids, mostly sophomores. Okay. The following year, you know, Chris, we had two defensive tackles that Steve Niehaus would have gone number one in the draft if he didn't take a bad injury. He still went very high. And Mike Fanny mm. played, I think, 10 years on the Rams. But we didn't have ends. And these two freshmen showed up, Ross Browner and Willie Fry. Yeah. Ross Browner went on to be voted a defensive player of the decade for the 70s. Led us okay. two national championships. But anyway, all of a sudden, these two freshmen and a defensive back named Luther Bradley, who won the Jim yeah. Tuck Award. Yeah. And so the year before, my the final game, we're playing USC. I'm in the stands in the Coliseum. We're up 24 to nothing. Okay. And Anthony Davis returns the kick at the end of the half for a touchdown. And we, and they score 55 straight points. We lost 55 Jeez. 24. So the following year, midseason, we're undefeated, 1973. And in comes Anthony Davis and the Trojans. And everywhere you walked on campus, they had the cover of Sports Illustrated. You couldn't avoid stepping on it. <laughs> and two of my best friends were Art Best and Eric Pennick. And uh, Notre Dame led it half, but the first play of the second half, they had an All-American linebacker named Richard Wood. And Art took him out, and Eric went 85 yards for a touchdown. That place went nuclear. Wow. And the Irish won it and went on to beat Alabama. That's the one with the pass. They beat Alabama. Okay, okay, Alabama. okay, all right, okay. First time they ever played Alabama. They both undefeated, untied. Alabama was number one. Notre Dame was number two. Uh, Alabama was a seven-point favorite, even though both were undefeated. Lead changed, uh, lead changed seven times second half. And Notre Dame was down 24, up 24 to 23, third and uh, 10 from your one-yard line. Jeez. And everyone thought he was going to run it just to and then kick, and he faked it, and he threw a pass to a guy named Robert Weber, the only catch of his career. Okay. The only catch of his career. I don't care how open you are. That's a tough catch. No kidding. He caught it, and that was the end of it, national championship. So, like you, you obviously played it, but it was an incredible time to be in college, to be in, you know, four number one games in four years. No kidding. Winning two of them and being number one. Just awesome. So... I was off, you know, you, you asked me one time, how'd you get hooked? Why well, that hooked me? That would have hooked me. <laughs> how could you not? That's awesome. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> so, I mean, it, during that time, I mean, do you remember, I mean, obviously going to games, I mean, the grotto, like, like what kind of endured you, outside of the athletic part, what kind of endured you to the university? Well, the thing that got me about Notre Dame was – Number one, I never felt like I was competing with the other students. Everyone tried to lift up everybody. So it okay. always felt like everybody was trying to do something good together. Number two, like the rest of the kids, I was away from home. Every, right. Only 2% of the student body is from Indiana. So everybody was away from home. And you bond in a way, as you well know, that was incredible. And, you know, I think I had like 10 roommates in four years, none from the same state. Wow. You know, Chris, when I went to, 
to Notre Dame from New York, I was like every other New Yorker, never in doubt. <laughs> you have to be wow. right. You just never in doubt. And I learned when you listen to really smart people and you and you can understand their argument, you have right. it, it really enriches the debate and it enriches who you are. That affected me tremendously when I got out of school because mm. I, I just felt like I was a much more rounded, mature person okay. because of the experience of the people I met. It's all the people, right? I mean, the school's fantastic. The education was fantastic. Faculty was great. The sports were great. But the people that I met there, my there's five guys that we text virtually every day to this day. We were in there as Wow. <laughs> really? Yeah. My room my freshman roommate was the best man at my wedding, you know, six years ago. I mean so it's it's just one of those places. Yeah, you know what's odd about Notre Dame to me? It's as intense you know, when you leave there as a senior, you see the golden dome, you go, Thank God I'm out of here, the weather. Right, like right, that. right. But as your life goes on, you feel more of an intense draw to that school every year. It's just, and I think everybody feels that. It's just, you know, people go, you're a crazy Notre Dame fan. I say, well, call me when you meet one that's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Very, very <laughs> true. Cold. Very true. So it, it, it definitely enriched me as a person and it made me, I think, set me up for success. So was it when you were there, I mean, did you have a plan? I mean, did you say, no. hey, you know, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to, no, no, no plan. You know, I, I, I wanted, I took full advantage of the last two years. The first two years, I was a little intimidated, to be honest. I came from a public school. These other kids were all private school. They were ahead of me. Okay. And this guy on my floor, I forget what they would call those guys. The guys, are, the smart guys are supposed to tell you what, you know, the seniors or whatever. Right. And the, and the guy said to me, you don't work that hard. You know, my thing in my head was I'm doing as well as the other guys. I'm not working that hard. That seemed like a cool <laughs> thing. <laughs> and I go, glad you noticed. And you still do pretty well. Yeah. He says, you know, when you get out of here, I'm interested. Is your plan, like if you apply to a job, say, I did pretty well and I don't even work hard? Is that you think that's going to, or if you apply to grad school? And I'm like, <laughs> it didn't wow. sound so good when someone else said it out loud. He said, I'll be honest with you. I think you're a little intimidated to, to really go for it. So he was able to identify that. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, honestly, I felt like hitting him at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was a wrestler. I'm like, well, you know, I don't need to hear that. And uh, I, I went for a run around the lake and I really, it just hit me. He's right. I, I have not bet at all because I was afraid that if I did, I guess, what if I don't do better? Maybe this sure. is it. And uh, I just decided, regardless of what happened, I would really put everything into that junior year specifically. Okay. And the fact I did, and I did really well, it just proved to me that I it wasn't against anybody else. That was the point. I never felt against. But it really said to me, I don't believe from that moment on I was ever outworked. Really? At any job, at anything I attacked. I attack with that mindset. I am going to give it everything I have. It doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. But I'm, I never, and, and again, I came from an environment where just the fact I got in Notre Dame was sure. monstrous to my family. Right. And if I came home and just made it through, it wouldn't have mattered what I did. So I didn't, I didn't have that person pushing me and telling me this is how you do it until that guy talked to me. And it really resonated with me and it changed my life. Well, I think that's so interesting because it's a random conversation to a sophomore that maybe the the person was like maybe an an, an RA or records an RA, assistant. That's what it okay, was. but that is that really if you think about it, that's their job. Oh, to, exactly. To try and help the kids on that floor, but not not everybody would have done it. Well, I just think that it's it's amazing because it's a conversation he's probably had a thousand times. Maybe yeah, I never thought and. <laughs> You know, it was what motivated you. Yeah. And not saying that you weren't motivated before, but the idea that what was a random conversation, yeah. which I, I'm going to get into later about what I think about leadership is and, and, and culture and character and stuff like that. But it's interesting to kind of, you were able to kind of pinpoint when that happened and it was that yeah. conversation. Well, you know, I went, as a, I went there as a pretty high-level wrestler, and then I did get hurt when I got there. Right. 
and I couldn't wrestle after my saw. I kept breaking my, I broke my nose and my cheekbones. I kept breaking them, and finally they said, we won't be able to reconstruct it if you break again. Jeez. You know, wrestling's a bad thing to have that injury because you're right, you're right there. So I lost the one thing that I, that I had identity with. That'd be right. like being a star football player and you can't play. Right. And you knew you were good at that, better than other people. And now mm-hmm. I had nothing that I was better than everybody at. And I realized that wasn't the goal. The goal is to be the best you can be. Mm. It wasn't about being better than everybody right. else. It was what is the best. And I'll tell you, it just resonated with me and it changed my life. So did your family have a chance to come down and see you? Did they ever come down and visit you at Notre Dame? Did they maybe go to any games when you were there? I mean, how was that experience uh, for your family? My, my parents came once to a game when I was a freshman, or not okay. when I was a junior, I guess, because I remember Eric and Art met him. But my senior year, my father came to the graduation, my father, mother, my grandmother, and my dad left a note under my pillow. And I'm like, that's kind of, he, when they left. Okay. And he said, Tom, I walked around campus today and I cried. And I said, I'd only seen him cry. He said, the fact that we all played some little part, and he played more than a little part, of you being able to go to this, yet, Chris, it's hard to describe how outside his experience Notre Dame would have been, much like your family. Sure. Right? If your mom came and saw you at Notre Dame, that's pretty far outside her experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, that just meant the world to me. You know, we'll get into leadership, but I believe one of the key ways of leading, one of the things my dad did for me is he put so much into being a parent. He had, he, he's always a hustler and he's doing multiple jobs, but he always showed up at my little league games. He coached me all the time. Wow. And I'd see the car going like that because he's coming in from New England. He's a traveling sales guy. And uh, I just didn't want to let him down. Uh. I think the best way to motivate someone is you put so much into it that when you ask back, they do it because they don't want to let you down. They're not afraid of you. They're not intimidated by you. They just don't want to let you down. And I think you have to sure. earn that. He earned that. It didn't. wasn't because he was my dad. He earned it. And I don't think when, you know, I've done a number of talks to the military, as you know, I've spoke for the Marine Corps at Quantico, and I spoke at West Point. And that resonates with them. You you don't follow someone because they have a stripe or... Right. I'm talking to people that they would go, I love that guy. That's someone that earned their respect. And so I, I, when, I, when I talk to people who are new to leadership or anybody, I just say, look, what have you done for them? before you ask, that's an important question. Mm. You know, it's like if it's walking up to somebody and say, hey, Chris, you know, you're behind your sales goals. You go, oh, thanks, I noticed. <laughs> right, right. Or at, I say, hey, Chris, I noticed your numbers aren't what you want them to be. Is there something you could be doing or that I could do to help you sure. with that? What sure. are the five things you're doing? Well, why don't you not do the last two? Because the first three are most important. I'll help you with that. Right. Now we're in it together. I'm helping you by narrowing it now you we're in it together otherwise you're just a walking spreadsheet so. wow they, see this this is this is what i i love about talking to you is that i mean i feel like as soon as we're finished like i'm i'm, I'm gonna be a smarter person because <laughs> the i mean and, and we've had numerous conversations but the idea of being able to kind of identify and understand what direction a company may be going, a group, a team. I mean, you've mentioned that you've, you've talked to our military. I mean, that just doesn't happen. I mean, somebody just doesn't wake up and go, hey, let me call Tom. I yeah. met Tom three days ago, let, let me do that. I mean, you have to put yourself in that situation. And so I'm gonna fast forward a little bit, but kind of, I, I, I do, I'm kind of curious, what was your first job after Notre Dame? I thought I was going to go to law school. Okay. And I wanted to be a defense attorney. I wanted to help people who couldn't help themselves. I've been a probation officer at Notre Dame. I just felt that if I was fortunate enough to have the skills, I could help people that couldn't help themselves. Then I saw the bill for law school. When I was <laughs> the I'm like, oh, that was a little intimidating. Then I met a very high profile par- uh, lawyer, partner of F. Lee Bailey, a famous lawyer. And he hated his job. I said, "If you would you do this again, if you could?" He said, "Absolutely not." I was, wow. He was, he was a personal. He was a criminal lawyer, and he said, "I would go into corporate law because you can change the law. This law is static. I'd had to pick the juries." He had never lost the case. 
And I'm thinking, imagine doing something your whole life. You don't even, at, at that level of success, Sure. you don't even, you wish you hadn't done it. And my brother met a guy in a bar. A lot of stories start that way. <laughs> <laughs> Some might say that about me. <laughs> uh, and the guy was, he was trying to sell, like, my brother worked for Merrill Lynch at the time. He's trying to okay. sell my stock. I said, I don't want any stock, but I sell computers. You should come work for me. And he says, well, I don't need a job. My brother just got out of the day. <laughs> really? People say, how do you get in the computer industry? And this guy, first of all, my phone rings. Tom Mendoza, yeah, I'm at my parents' house. I wasn't even supposed to be there. I never was there. Oh, my gosh. Like, 1 o'clock in the morning, he goes, crazy Jim Brown. All my friends are crazy somebody. So I figure, I'll, yeah, you, you kind of try to make it wait until you figure out. Right, 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 exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. And I'm like, hey, crazy Jim. He goes, oh, <laughs> you don't know me. Oh. He goes, I'm in a bar in El Paso, Texas, with your brother. <laughs> oh my God! At one in the morning. Hey, he goes, go to New York tomorrow morning. The city. I live sixty miles outside. Okay. And they're gonna meet this guy, and he's not a nice person. He's kind of a, an idiot, but he says he's the number one guy. And if he offers you a job, get on a plane. I'll hire you. <laughs> so I ended up in New York City at a company called Burroughs, which was a, they were at a, they, they got bored eventually, but they were a company that competed with IBM that trained people. They took young okay. people out of college, trained you for a few years, and then you move on because they don't pay that much. But okay, uh, so it was actually a great place to start. I walked in this guy's office. Made me wait a half hour. I'm waiting for this interview. And I finally brings me in. And he's doing his expenses as he's asking me questions. He's asking me questions like, so, Chris, tell me about yourself. And he's right. <laughs> wow. And they had taken over, like, what used to be a uh, shopping mall. Okay. And so it was, like, all glassed in. And all these women out here on typewriters, that's kind of what it was like back then. And so I got up out of my chair and I stood on his desk. <laughs> and he's like, that's <laughs> Really? And, and that's what he said. And he and he doesn't look up. And he goes, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, at least I have your attention now. Wow. Get off my desk. So I get off his desk. He's looking at me. He's, what, what do you think you're doing? I said, listen to me. I, I drove an hour and a half to get here. I waited out there a half hour. You're doing your expenses as you're talking to me. Either show me some respect or I'll leave. He hired me. He said, you are. There, see, there you go. That's great. New York City, that's what they want. You're going to be knocking on people's doors trying to get in, right? Oh, my gosh. I got on a plane. I went to El Paso, Texas the next morning, and I went to Burroughs. So I got in the technology industry, and by chance, went well. So he, if you don't mind, I'll just tell you what worked for me. Please, please, so absolutely. Very quick. That's why Number we're here. one, I found out something I really like to do, sell. I found an, a specific kind of selling. Not transactional. I sell you something. I never meet you again. Right. I like to. I like to figure out problems, really understand what your problem is, and then find what my product can do to solve your problem, my company or my product, and build a relation such that we're gonna. I like to sell a few people a lot, not a lot of people something. Sure. So that's the skill. That's so, so selling. Then number two, when I was 26, they asked me to lead the group. Because we had done better than they ever expected. I hired three guys from Notre Dame, including my college roommate. And we had really turned what was a sleepy office into a high-performing office. People moved wow. to Phoenix to retire. No, we were now in Phoenix, by the way. Two years ago, I passed it. I moved to Phoenix. Okay. I was with a second technology company called Data General. And they made me the district manager at 26. And I, when they first said to me, we want to make you the manager, I said, no, it's like herding cats. You know, right now, mm -hmm. long-term planning is what's for dinner. I mean, like <laughs> making more money than they ever thought I was going to make at that time. I'm like, I don't want any responsibility. And uh, the other guy said, look, you got to take it. They'll bring in some guy we don't know, and they'll change the whole culture here. And uh, wow. I did it. I was the district manager of the year for the company a year later at 27. I was 10 years younger than anybody in the company. Oh. It's, a big, it's a big company. But... So the second thing was, as soon as I got in leadership, people ask me sometimes, Chris, do you, you know, how do you know your leadership's for you? I said, would you rather give a plaque or get a plaque? I got tremendously more satisfaction at it, pulling someone on stage and talking sure. about them than I did of someone talking about me. Okay. 
And I obviously I like that, but I'm telling you, when I hired somebody or they worked for me and I saw them succeed, I saw them make good money, and then I saw them get promoted, that was a much bigger rush. And so I said, this is what I'll do the rest of my life. I'm gonna I'm gonna lead. And I have, I've led ever since. And then the, the third thing that happened is I started to learn I, I learned how to do public speaking. And that okay. that is that so I I was at my third company was my first startup, a company called Stratus. I was hired by a guy named John Mortgage. Cisco Systems, first CEOs. Uh, John Mortgage Way is what Cisco Systems sits on. So he was my direct boss. Wow. He's a legend in Silicon Valley. And um, I sent my guys back to sales training. I called the guy up who runs it. I said, how is it that everybody I send you comes back stupider than before I send them? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, what? I said, I'm serious. They come back and... They have this big slide deck and they go through it regardless of what the other guy wants to hear. I'm horrified. This is stupid. He goes, you think you could do better? Of course I can do better. Wow. <laughs> so I flew back to Boston. Bostonian people were not that thrilled to have a guy in L.A. telling them how stupid he <laughs> <laughs> And I flew in and I knew the problem right away. Everybody teaching these guys how to sell had never sold anything in their life, much less this product. And they, they basically said, imagine what you're selling. You take them through this whole catalog of slides for now. Right. And then go to the next call. And someone's going to go, oh, that's what I'm looking for. That's just completely ridiculous. If you have an hour, you'd be better off spending 30 or 40 minutes hearing what their problems are. Exactly. Exactly. Talking a little bit about what you have and having another call. Right. That's how you sell it. That's what I was trying to tell him. So I, he, while I was there, he said, if you can teach them, go ahead. All right. I stood up. And I said, you know, let me tell you, everything you heard today is wrong. <laughs> Start with that. And, wow. And then let me tell you what half of those things I did, that's how I know they're wrong. I'm not telling you because I read a book about it. That will not work. Let me tell you what is working. Now, my district's the number one district in the company. Let me tell you why. And let mm. me tell you about the most successful salespeople, what they've done the first 90 days and 180 days to be successful. They were like, this is what they want. They're going back to their livelihoods depend on coming out of here knowing stuff. So, but that moment, so I ended up teaching every sales training course at Data General. Every really? month I flew. Nothing in it for me, but I, I realized I was learning to speak on my feet and influence people. And the, okay. key, the key to giving, to really be, and, and later on, as you know, I, I, I've been speaking all over the world for a long time, but the key to being a really, really effective speaker different than other people is I focus on what do you want the audience to feel, not what do you want them to know. Okay. Because no one's, Chris, no one's ever changed anything in their life because they read a fact. Right. They changed their life because that, that guy talking to me at Notre Dame, I had a feeling that was so intense that I decided I was going to do something about it. Mm. And so when I, get in front of audience. The largest audience I've ever spoken from is 17,000 people at Moscone, which is the big Oracle world. I had the main stage a few wow. times. When I spoke for the Marines, it was 1,700 Marines at Quantico, Virginia, with 700 watching in Iraq. Oh. And you are challenged to make them feel. So I, right. so I take time to talk to whoever's asking me to come speak. And that's the question I said, when I leave, now where, why are you asking me to? You said about the Marine Corps, I, I spoke at Oracle World it was 1,500 CIOs, and, a, and the Marines were, had just become a big customer of my company, NetApp. Okay. And a colonel in the Marine Corps walked up to me, and he says, do you give motivational speeches? As I said, I do, but they're typically to my own company. I'm not, right. you know, it's not like my living. And he said, well, General Kelly would like to invite you to come to Quantico, Virginia. And I was like, wow. Wow. I said, to do what? He said, well, we want you to talk about what do you want me to talk about? I said, culture and leadership. I said, to the Marine Corps? I had just had dinner with about eight Marines of different ranks that okay. night, uh, the night before. I said uh -huh. week, and they were talking about, I asked, what's the proudest three moments of Marine Corps history? And it didn't matter that Bella Wood, Guadalcanal, you know, whatever, whatever they, Kusan, whatever they decided to talk about. They all knew, and they had detailed knowledge. I said, how do you know all that? They said, Marines died. Marines died. Wow. Everybody knows about it before you leave Paris Island. 
Wow. And, like, and you want me to talk about culture? Right, right, exactly, exactly. So I come in the night before. General Mattis is a very famous guy now. General right. Mattis was at the table. General Kelly was the guy who invited me. Okay. And he said, uh, you're probably wondering why you're here. We're having drinks, having fun. I'm speaking in the morning. I'm like, yeah. And he said, you're going to speak to a demoted group of Marines. I said, really? He said, it was the guys making the vehicles when they were getting their arms and legs blown off every time they went out by the roadside bombs in Iraq. Wow. And he said, and he said, they hear crap from the media. They hear crap from the Congress with all the flag waving that hasn't given them the vehicle. They, they know how to solve it. They won't fund it. And he said, and worst of all, the Marines on the ground don't want to hear it. They're <laughs> like, you guys suck. And so he said, I want you to challenge them. <laughs> 1,700 Marines. And I'm in there. And I'm, it's going great. I had two NetApp guys in the front row, one guy named Mark Weber, right at the end. He said, how are we getting out of here? It didn't go small. <laughs> the two generals were in the front. It's going great. And finally, I said, there's so many things. They go, hoo right? The Marine Corps. And at first, I was like, God bless you. But then it, it, was, it was like a revival meeting. Mm. And, the, and I said to him, there's so many things I'm impressed by. Let me tell you something I'm not impressed by, and that's your attitude. 1700. Chairs just shot forward. They looked at wow. me like, you got it. Shit. You came to Quantico, Virginia. Are you going to say that to us? Wow. During war? And, I, and the only two people smiling were the two generals. They were like, this is what we're here. <laughs> and, and by the way, he told me, the General Mattis was made this point. He said, look, I give a lot of talks. These guys listen to me. But there's only so many times the same person can say the same things and have them hear it. Sure. I'm taking you from outside. We don't have people coming here from outside. And I want you to challenge him. I'm going to build you up as my guy. And I want you to go after him. And I said, and after they, I, I let that sit for probably, I would say, two minutes, which is an mm. amazingly long time when you're in a room like that with angry Marines. Of course. And, and I did eye contact across the room. And then I said, you are you are so angry that the press is on you. You're angry that the Congress is not fixing and helping you fix the problem, giving you the funds. You're angry with the guys on the ground don't understand how hard you're trying. I said, you didn't join the Marine Corps to have someone else make you fulfilled. You joined the Marine Corps to be the point of the spear. You are the point right. of the spear. There are people who have come home with one arm, one leg that would never have come home six months ago because of what you've done. I said, let me tell you something. You are lucky fuckers. That's exactly what I said. I'm sorry about that. Wow. So I got a YLF shirt from the Marine Corps. They went nuts. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's, that's a great story. I spoke for another part of the Marine Corps and the Navy out in San Diego, and about 30 guys who were in that first talk came and created a tunnel for me to walk out and told me what it meant to no way. It was cool. It was wow. very, very cool. That's awesome. Well, the whole, the whole point of that was, though, that just to wrap up real quick on that. Sure. That if I had to say the steps of things, find something that you're really passionate about. Because if you don't really like doing it, you're not going to be that good at it. Right. And I really realized I love that type of selling, enterprise okay. selling. Secondarily, if you're, not, if you're not really a leader and it, it's not what drives you, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Be an individual contributor and do a fantastic job at that. Everybody's got a role that they love. Do that. And then finally, I think it's very important to be skilled enough with how you speak. There's no always have to be speeches. Right. But I tell students, I tell young people, if there's five people in a room and one person's always speaking and giving their opinion, the other four are not getting ahead of that person. <laughs> that's true. That's if true. If you're really true. smart and quiet, that's not a great Right. <laughs> as far as career advice. And so, you know, I, I recommend Toastmasters to a lot of young students. They okay. started a chapter at Notre Dame after a talk I gave there. And uh, a young woman started and did a fabulous job. Toastmasters is teaching techniques for speaking. Right. With a friendly audience. Sure. And people become very, very good. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it's a, those three things, I think, if you had to say what worked for you, that, that set it up. All right. So... One thing, I'm just going to talk a little bit about your experience at NetApp because I want to come back and talk talk about you giving some talks to the Notre Dame football program. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about 
kind of how you got to that app and how you were able to kind of make your mark there? That's a great question. And for those who aren't familiar, so I joined that app in uh, May of 94. Mm -hmm. And it, it's in the online data storage field. So okay. if you look at an iPhone, everything that's stored on here is stored on NetApp devices that Apple okay. buys. So iTunes, iCloud, Siri. But at the beginning, we were just a raw startup. 32 people, 600,000 in revenue. Today it's 6 billion, about 13,000 people. It's Fortune 500 for a long, long time. And my initial job was to run sales in North America. Okay. Uh, one year later, I get, they asked me to take on Worldwide. But uh, I only had three salespeople. So, you know, yeah. we had to do 16 million. They did 600 grand in the first three months or two months. So it was, then a miracle happens, part of the strategy. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, it was not a good scene. But we made it happen. They, they hired, a, so the two founders worked at a previous company. I had been at the, one of the first storage companies called Auspex. And these two okay. guys were young geniuses who created the product, they went and formed NetApp. Okay. And then we hired a seat. So my job when I came in was to raise the money to help to do the sales high enough that we could get the money from the right person who would hire the right CEO. That's not a great strategy, by the way. That's chances of that succeeding. And uh, we turned it around fast. They did 4.6 billion the first quarter, million, which really got the company going. It attracted Sequoia Capital, which is the number one venture capital firm in the world. Don Valentine founded the firm. John Morgridge called me, said, Don's interested in investing. Uh, and we told him we'd take his money if he became our chairman. He And Don was trying not to be chairman anymore. He was chairman of Cisco. Okay. But he became chairman, and we were on the cover of the Wall Street Journal the next day. Wow. And then he attracted the right board and the right CEO, Dan Warmanhoven. And so Dan... Uh, who has an engineering background. He was one of the youngest vice president of engineering ever at IBM. And then he had done a, a, a CEO job and he walked into a mess. And he, he didn't leave and Don Valentine was on that board, but it was not a success. And Don hired him. He said the two best CEOs ever hired were him and John Morgan. John Morgan was told by my previous company, Stratus, we'll never hire a sales guy to run this company. That's why he, he left and did a startup because he wanted to get his shot. He ends up on okay. the system. Okay. But Don said they both were desperately wanting to prove they could do it. Mm. I mean, there's something in that, right? He said, there's other guys assume they're going to do it. These guys were never given a shot. Best two hires ever. So Dan became CEO. And the thing we did right, so as you know, go, go fast forward. Uh, that was 94. 2009, we voted number one company in America to work for. We were in the top 10, 12 years in a row. Mm. Um, we went from zero to a billion our first six years. Uh, one of the fastest growing companies in American history at the time. Uh, we were voted number one in 15 countries. But the seminal moment for me was right after Dan joined. He joined in November. I joined in May. And then in January, we had our first offsite. So it's the four of us and a few of the other leaders in the company. And uh, what do we stand for? What is it that we're going to create, we said. It was an offsite, And we came out with, we're going to build a company that we're proud of the rest of our lives. That's what we're going to do. So it wasn't when we're going to be Fortune 500. Right. Not gonna, we're not going to win this list. It's not how much money the company is going to make. We are, and that infused who we hired, how we led how we evaluated employees. Do I want this person on my team? Am I proud? I'm, I'm telling you, given what you accomplished in football and those Notre Dame years you were there, I guarantee you when you look left and right, you were proud of the people on that team. Sure. And I felt as the leader, it was my job to make sure that everybody who looked left and right was going to be proud of those of themselves, uh, of each other. Right, Otherwise, right, right. It was my job, do something about it, right? So... It was just a, an incredible success. So I did that. I was I ran sales for six years. Yeah, I honestly was thinking of uh, potentially doing another startup because I liked okay. it. And I, I told Don Valentine and Dan Warman over, I think I'm, I'm going to go because they told me I had to give them six months notice if I ever thought about it. Okay. And they said, take time off and we'll talk again. And I went and I, Palm Desert, where I had a home and I was golfing. Everybody I met who was anywhere near my age who, quote, retired, went back to work. 
you know, <laughs> they go home and they're now what? Right, right. You know, so I start telling you I want to swing a golf club. And I'm like, okay, so maybe retirement's not in my cards at this point in my life. But I like, so I, I waited until the last day before I went back and asked myself a simple question. If I turn the car key on tomorrow, do I want to go to Sand Hill Road, which is where all the venture capitalists are? Because Valentine says, if you're not going to be at NetApp, you're going to be at a Sequoia company. Or do I want to go to NetApp? And there was nothing wrong with NetApp. At this point, we were like a rocket ride, but I felt like we've already done this. I'll let somebody else do this and I'll do another one. Wow. And I said, you know what? I like NetApp. And I stayed and I ended up spending 25 years because I was the longest wow. employee in the history of the company, besides the two founders, of course. Oh. And uh, it was a phenomenal thing. I, re I left there last August. I'm now on other tech boards. Okay. But, you know, I, I got to do what I want to do the entire time. But my last 10 years as vice chairman, Valentine said to me in 2009, he said, you flew 375,000 miles last year, commercial miles. I never flew under 250 in my first 20 years at NetApp. But 375, 25,000 circumvents the globe. The worst what? man. So he goes, I said, you know, I actually am aware of that. He says, Tom, even you are smart enough to know this is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He said, you're going to wake up in a bad hotel in Shanghai. Sure, sure, absolutely. He said, listen, you don't want to be CEO. That was not my goal. And he said, we have a guy we brought in. We want to make COO. And we don't want to look like it's a contention with you because I was president. Okay. I, I was president from 2000, 2009. He said, I want to make you vice chairman. Vice, so what that was, is I had two parts of my job. One is I had a lot of people reporting to me, number of thousands of people. So I had operational, you know, right. budgets and headcount. He said, we got a lot of people who like to do that stuff. That's not really, they can do it as well as you. I'm like, no argument. <laughs> he said, but, you know, you're the face of the company with our employees, our customers, and our partners. You just focus on that. Work with the CEO on his staff, on his strategy, and don't leave. If you want to mm. stay, we don't want you to go anywhere. And that was it. And I, I did that for 10 years, and it was phenomenal. I got to focus completely on our own people, our customers, and our partners. I still traveled a lot, but it was all under my control. It wasn't uh, as out of control. That was my story in that. Wow. Wow. This is Chris Zorich. Being part of some very successful teams, what I valued most was the collaboration and the chance to work toward common goals. Komar, derived from the Gaelic word meaning collaboration. Komar Partners is a recognized leader in retained executive search, professional recruiting, and talent advisory services. We are trusted advisors to our clients. We view our work on behalf of our clients as mission critical, and with the knowledge that a great resulting hire will have a direct effect on our clients' businesses. It's time to collaborate, cultivate, and connect. Why choose Komar Partners? The difference is clear. We lean in and have a tenacious approach to our work through innovation, knowledge management, process execution, and an industry leading team of professionals. As part of every search, we provide a compensation analysis, a third party executive assessment, and one on one onboarding and acculturation coaching. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's a great, great legacy. That, that, it that was cool. It was, it was very, very cool. That's, um, that has to be uh, one of your proudest moments, all right? But I know of another one that um, you shared with me a while ago, and I just want folks to hear about this because this is just, I mean, this is amazing. <laughs> this is just, uh, it's about your dad, and it's about um, him having a chance to kind of come back to Notre Dame mm -hmm. and, and how special you made that moment for him. Can you share that with us, please? Sure. Yeah. You know, I never told that story. I, I was given a talk at uh, North Carolina State. Okay. Law, they're a very good business and engineering school. There. And uh, someone asked me the question, what's your proudest moment? And like in a flash, I knew what it was, but I never talked about it publicly. So Wow. So um, when we did the endowment ceremony, uh, endowed the business school 20 years ago, uh, this past September, by the way. Nice. Yeah. So, so I did it in the uh, year 2000. And they want. They said to me, "We want to have a ceremony." I'm like, "Yes, okay." <laughs> if you have a plaque or something, mail it to me. 
There, okay, no, no, no. okay. They said, it's really not about you. We want other people to realize this is a right. cool thing to do. Right, right. <laughs> you know, help us out here. Got to rope them in. Right, exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> this for this for other people, too. That's right. So they put a two-day ceremony on. Okay. And so, of course, I invited my dad. He was the only my mom had passed. And uh, my mom actually passed six months after I joined NetApp. So she missed mm. the, whole, the whole run. And uh, my dad got claustrophobia late in life. Okay. We were actually at Notre Dame Stadium for a game. And he said, we got to get out of here. We had to leave. And, and he just couldn't be in crowds anymore. Wow. And uh, he said to me, I'll, I'll come, but I, I don't know if I can handle this stuff. And I said, well, if it really gets bad for you, we'll just go back. I'll okay. just say, sorry, I can't do it. And I told okay. him that. They go, we'll do whatever we can to make them comfortable. So I get there. We we started the day um, at the Mendoza College of Business, meeting everybody. And I gave a talk at the football luncheon. Uh, Urban Meyer was the other speaker. He was a defensive back coach. Right, okay. Bob Davey was the coach. Okay. And um, we were playing number one Nebraska. I'm sure a lot of people listening, if they're Notre Dame fans, remember when the <laughs> stadium turned red. Right, on turned red. But it was a great game. Uh, and then they uh, after we, we did the talk, we went to the business school uh, right after the luncheon. And I said something there, Chris. My dad was on the side. He wouldn't come into the room. Warren Buffett, I, later on, I found out. I was fortunate enough to get to know Warren. Played golf with Tiger Woods, and Warren was my caddy. But that's that's for another podcast. <laughs> but anyway, and he said to me later, I heard you speak before. I go, what was that? He was out there because we're playing Nebraska. Wow. Front row is Condoleezza Rice and uh, Jack Welsh and some other people. And uh, I said, if three things happen to yourself in your life, you should consider yourself fortunate. One, if you live in a country where this can happen to you, right? Uh, you know, my parents are, are immigrants. Their, their parents came from, my dad's dad came from Cuba. His mother came from Ireland. And my mother's parents both off the boat, Czechoslovakian. Mm. So, you know, they were the second generation. Sure. But they got to live in America. It never would have happened in any of those countries. And I said, number two, if you have parents who tell you you can't. We didn't have any money, mm. but I never really thought about we didn't have any money. Because right. they always made me feel like I was blessed to be in the situation I was in, and I knew I had their support. And it wasn't until later when I saw people who didn't have both parents or didn't didn't have parents who were, even they could be wealthy, but if their parents didn't care for them or right. show them love, right. I, I didn't have that problem, thank God. And then number three, I said, if you have somebody who, can wake, who wakes up with your... Uh, best interest in heart and you feel that way toward them. So you're giving and you have a team. Sure. And I was blessed with that then. I'm more than blessed with that now. I'm incredibly blessed with that now. Uh, I said, but today only, I have to say this, and I, he's not going to like it, but can you imagine if you were the father and you, and you had come from very modest means, you never got to go past sixth grade, you, you fought in the Pacific at 16, and now you're going to watch your name because they put the name up on the building right after that. Mm. And I said, he's going to hate me for this, but I got to bring him up here. Oh. And he tried to push back, push back, and they shoved him up, and he came up on the stage. Oh. And we hugged, and everybody stood. I'll bet they stood for, I've had people write me letters about it. It was at least five minutes, maybe a Wow. Time. And they were crying the entire, everyone was crying. We were oh. crying, they were crying. And uh, then they held a black tie mass that night, which kind of crazy. A packed house, Father. Uh, oh, what's his? Oh, jeez. Former best Malloy, Father Malloy was okay. the president. Uh -huh. He did the mass. And then uh, they held a under a tent for us. But then the next day, we walked into the lock. We went to church with the team. Okay. When he used to go to the cathedral. Yeah. We walked through all the students to get to the stadium. You can imagine how crazy it was for number one. Game. Oh into the locker room and then i went down and i did a tv interview quickly on nbc okay and then my dad walked the flag out for the anthem mm. for those of you who have never been to notre dame stadium it's it's not a fooling around thing i say that like stanford likes to fool out the tree and all that right thing. right no, no no right right it's uh someone takes the flag in this case my dad and he walks over to the irish guard and, and they start to intone the, 
a very serious oath to each other, basically, about how we live our lives. And he presents it to the guard. And as the flag's going up, it was halfway up. And two Mirage fighters went right over us. And I'm sure you've oh been to the stadium. God. But they'd be standing right on the floor. I got the chills. With my dad in front of me. And my dad snapped into a salute. Oh. And it was like, there it is. That's the moment. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Never forgot that. That is, Never that's, will. I mean, uh, I wanted you to tell that story because, I mean, that's really kind of the, what everyone wants to do for a person they love. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about being an immigrant, you talked about him, sixth grade education, and yet he was able to give you the qualities to become the individual you are. Yeah. And you mentioned before about kind of not having that person in your life or not having those types of opportunities. Um, I'm going to segue a little bit here. One of your, um, I call them uh, Tom Talks, one of your conversations with Tom Mendoza, you mentioned a book. And it was by, um, what's the guy's name? Um, uh, Daniel Brown. And it's called The Boys in the Boat. Yeah. Great. And Tom, like, really, after you, because you talked about kind of character, you talked about leadership, you talked about a culture. And it's like, yeah, you know, you read this book and, and that's what you're able to get. Yeah. And, and I was like, well, okay, I'm going to learn about that. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm 51. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I still want to learn. And I thought it was fascinating. And, and literally, the story is about the the crew team at University of Washington and how, and this was 30, what, like 30? Mid thirties. Mid thirties. And how they went from literally nothing. I mean, they weren't on scholarship. They, they were, were a team. They individuals were a team. from people, all, all, all different parts of the, of the area or the country. And eventually they wound up winning the gold medal in the 36 Olympics, but, well, but can you, you kind of put that little more fine point on it? Crew, even today, especially then, was at elite schools: Yale, Harvard, right. Princeton. Right. And the one powerhouse in the West was Cal. Right. I think the guy had come from the East Coast. Yeah. They had money. I mean, these guys had the best boats. This guy had this old boat, <laughs> and these kids were working in the fields or whatever in the manufacturing plant. Sure. Then going to school. Well, 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 first time, tell me, share with us why you enjoy the book. Yeah, one, one, one quick side note. Sure. When Clark Lee was named defensive coordinator, he asked to speak to me through a friend. Notre Dame, yeah. Pete Sampson. That's his favorite book, too. Oh, really? Okay. Absolutely. And, and, and I remember having this conversation with him. And the thing about it is, and I, I, I've never done crew, but... I always wonder, like, what's the guy with the foghorn doing? You know, right, right. <laughs> but it turns out that every single person in that boat has a very, very specific job that if they don't do it at an extraordinary level, the whole boat fails. There's no chance to win. If that guy's not doing the right beat, because he's it's not a consistent thing. Right. He has to determine when they're going to go all out because it's a long race and right there's strategy to it. And you had these people who didn't have any kind of formal training and they all bought in and they beat all these other teams one after another. And I thought that is what a great team's about. It's yes. not like when you're never going to have, well, you know, Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson get the best of what they want every year. Sure. But to beat somebody like that, it takes all the boys in the boat. Yes, it does together believing in each other and create and then that's a culture conversation you know when we talk about culture it, it has to do with will we sacrifice for each other how important mm -hmm. is it to me and to you that we win together right that, that i will do whatever i can to make sure you, i got you know i have your back you know for a fact and that's that's what they did in that and i think NetApp at its best was that way. I believe mm. Notre Dame football at its best is that way. This Notre Dame football team. Um, Lance Taylor's the running back coach. And I've got to know Lance well. Okay. 
And he called me preseason this year. He said, would you talk to the running backs on culture? And he and I have had great talks wow. on culture. Now, remember, Clark Lee wanted to talk about culture. Right. Lance Taylor t- wanted to talk about the culture of his running back room. And then he called me two days later. He said, Tommy Rees, who I've, I've, I've communicated with Tommy for a few years, but I okay. never, um, I'd spoken to him on the phone even, but I've never seen him live until then. Okay. He said, Tommy would appreciate if you would talk to the offense. So that's what I ended up doing instead of, and I spent probably 40 minutes talking about the culture, what I believe the elements of culture are and the importance of culture. Mm. And then we did about a 45 minute Q and A. And I got notes from so, so many guys on the team. And then Tommy and I had a one-on-one after that, and Ian Book and I had a one-on-one after that. Wow. And the thing that struck, you can tell by the questions you're you're getting asked, if they really understand, they really care about what we're talking about. This team was so into, we want to do something extraordinary together. We believe we can, even with the pandemic and all the things. So it's been an incredible joy to me to watch them do it, knowing what they put into this thing. And the leadership that no, that Brian Kelly's leadership on this team clearly, to me, is by far the best leadership team we've had since Lou Holtz. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, absolutely, clearly. hands down, hands and, down. Uh, you know, some fans I don't know if they always get that, but these, the way they look at each other, the way they talk about each other, the way they talk about Tommy Reese, the way they talk about Clark Lee, the way he talks about them and their families, they he know they know he cares about them. That's the essence of culture, you know. Again, they've earned the right to ask back, and these guys want to right. give it to them. Right. So the main character in the book is Joe Rance, and he came from beyond humble, humble oh, beginnings, right? Terrible his, beginnings. his parents left him at 10. I mean, it, it, it's Wait, crazy. When you say they left him, they left him. I mean, they, they literally left him at the door. Like, it, it was crazy. I mean, I, and, and, went home and there was nobody there. They just left him. If, 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 if the folks listening have a chance, please read the book. It's a phenomenal book. But it's, it's great because it starts off and Joe Rance is, is, is in the 70s. And when, the, when the, the author of the book went to interview him, he always talked about the boat, the boat, the boat. And as I'm reading, I'm like, okay, you know, I mean, I, I've been involved in athletics, okay, team, whatever. But hearing what he meant by the boat in the beginning and kind of his journey, literally, you know, having to live on his own and as he got older and older and older. And that boat was literally what, what life was, right? I mean, yeah. you, you had a chance to depend on the person in front. And that person in front of you is like six inches. And... If you don't do well, that person in front of you doesn't do well, and vice versa. They and so well. it was it was such a great book because and and, and I thought about this, Tommy, and, and again, thank you for, for, for talking about it. But I talked to, I, I thought about kind of my experience and I kind of correlated it with kind of what I was reading in the book, which was, you know, um, Coach Holtz grabbed a whole bunch of kids from different parts of the country, and no one thought we were going to do anything. I mean, I, I came from a home where it was rough. I mean, rough neighborhood, all this other stuff. And somehow we gelled together, and I thought about kind of the boat as the, the team, right? Yeah. And so I thought about this, and, and, and I think that literally when I'm 78, hopefully I have a chance to live that long, but the idea – of what that team meant to me, and, and it was four years of his life. Yeah. And since then, I mean, again, they had a chance to go on and, 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 and win gold in the Olympics, in the Berlin Olympics, but they met every year after that, they met 10 years after that, and these guys would, would put their, their suit, their, their uniforms back on and take the boat out <laughs> and go and do this thing, and literally for the next 50 years. And this was, it was amazing because it was an unspoken word, and that person in that boat, you knew what that person was thinking, but it took, it took, you know, for, it, it took their, their, their back being broken, it took sweat and tears right. for them to understand it. And I think that's what you're talking about when you're talking about culture, and you're talking about leadership is, you know, I have to care about you. Because you can come in, and you could be the most successful, you, you can be anybody you want to be, but if you don't care about me, I'm not going to follow you. Yeah, I, the saying that I believe is I've lived to in my life for leadership 
I didn't come up with it. It's sometimes credit to Teddy Roosevelt, but I think it was probably just some random person. He, he believed it and lived it, which is people don't care what you know unless they know that you care. Right. They just don't. Right. If somebody, you know someone cares about you. If somebody called right now and say, sorry, Chris, I got to go. If I got, there are only a few people in life that could do that. But no questions asked. If someone said, I need you right now, I go. And just, we all have that list. We have a list. And why? Because they intensely care about you and you care about them. If you can expand that to a team, mm. that's an incredibly bonding and strength forming thing to have happen. Now, you have to admit, you and Tony Rice and the boys, you get out every year and put the uniform on. Oh, yeah. No, right, right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Actually. There's rumors that you guys might get on bikes together. Is that true? Uh, they may be rumors. I don't know. You know, yeah, who, yeah. who knows? Actually, uh, Tony's in, in your area yeah. now, so maybe we all might ride down and, and, and have you rent a bike and, and hang out with us. Little but, motorcycle action. Pardon me? Little motorcycle action, right? A little bit, little a bit. little bit, yeah. But, and so the thing that I find fascinating when – People talk about leadership. So you, you've talked to Marines. I mean, you've talked to uh, folks at Oracle. You, you've done some amazing speeches, right? But you, you've also talked in front of, you know, 15, 16, or 18-year-old um, uh, football players who are like, I mean, who's this guy? You know, I yeah. mean, who's this guy coming in? And instantly, all of a sudden, they're at attention. And that... I mean, you're showing them that you care, but being able to talk to a Marine and talk to your sales force and talk to an 18 year old kid is, is, is different. And can you talk a little bit about what, I mean, how businesses fail when they don't have the proper culture? I mean, I mean, how do you institute, and I know it takes time, I'm not saying you have the, the magic pill, but the idea of kind of a culture change I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? First of all, I think the thing that separates our businesses long term is culture. And I've always believed that. And I, let, me, let me back up a second. You, you can make a lot of money by treating people poorly, clearly. Uh, there are a lot of companies that their culture is I pay you a lot, you do what I want. If you don't do it, I fire you. Right. So that, I'm not saying you can't be successful like that. There's a, you know, there's a lot of evidence of people who don't treat people well. It can rise Absolutely. up pretty high in this country. Absolutely. Uh, I, I wanted, I never wanted to be that. I, my view of when I went into business, remember I was going to be a lawyer trying to help people. Right. When I got in business, I wanted to always be the group that did it right to where we could be proud of ourselves. And that means that we are going to A, serve our customers. We're, we're going to take care of them. They're going to, they're going to buy something and we're going to make it work. You know, my brother and my dad, my my uncle were in stock brokerage, and I knew I didn't want to do that because you have no control over whether it works or not. Right. Okay. Best intentions, I can lose all your money. But if I sell you a product and I'm selling it correctly, even if things go wrong, I can make it work. I can get I can make it work for this company. And I love that. I love to be a rep with a product. And especially when I became an executive where I could really make the decisions to make right. it work. So the number one thing is we got it, we gotta Sell something, as, as, as Walton said, Sam Walton, sell people something, make them, make them happy to tell a friend. And the one thing you control the most, though, in a company is your own employees. Mm -hmm. You can't get, I, I can control outcomes, but let's face it, you buy from people who are committed and happy. I, when, I, right. when I deal with people, I don't want to deal with people who are dragging, they don't want to be there. You know, fly on some of the domestic airlines, you're like, oh, geez. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Whoa. So I've always felt, look, in our own culture, I'll, I'll, let me tell you what the NetApp culture was. Because as I flew all those miles, the one requirement I had, Chris, is you had to let me talk to our own people because we were hiring so fast that if you didn't keep the same culture and right. new people coming in would change it. And, and I didn't want a NetApp Japan culture, a NetApp China culture, a NetApp America culture. I mm -hmm. want a NetApp culture. Right. Certainly you tune it to the culture for business transactions, but the type of things I'm about to tell you are true worldwide. And I can tell you it was true for 15 years, my first 15, when I had direct control of it. That, you know, that, that's really where I, what I'm speaking to. 
Five elements that I look for in culture. Number one's attitude. Nothing great has ever been done by people who didn't want to do it, ever. And so the minimum requirement for me, for someone to work for me, is they got to come ready to go. Mm. If they were looking for me to wake them up every day and convince them again it was a good idea to be here, I told them go <laughs> find another place to do it. That's not it. Because I, you control your own attitude. Every day you wake up and decide how the world's going to look at you. There isn't, I'm trying to find someone to say, you know, I have a shitty attitude. It's really worked out great for me. Right. It doesn't really right. work that way. Right. So come in, you know, if you're new, buy the pizza. Be there late with the person who does know what they're doing. You can make a contribution. But people always evaluate your attitude. If I said to you, what do you think of Chris? People are going to talk about your attitude. Can I trust him? You know, what's his, what's his work ethic? Mm -hmm. When he makes a commitment, does he keep it? This it's all tied to your attitude. This isn't like something you got to make up. You're right. Not a skill. Right. You are that person or you're not. Right. So attitude's number one, and I don't work around it. I mean, if you don't if you don't want to be here, we're gonna have a very simple discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and I have. And the second thing is candor. And when I when I've spoke to companies, I've spoken at executive levels, and sometimes they ask me to speak at the secondary levels. When you speak at the secondary levels, oh, my God, I wish our executives believed this. Dan Hesse is a famous Notre Dame. Uh, yeah. Dan yeah. was the CEO of Sprint. Right. He asked me to come speak at Sprint. Okay. And I spoke to the secondary level. <laughs> That's who, oh, my God, they don't want they don't want candor. If you come with bad news, you're screwed. Wow. you got to come with the news they want. Wow. And that, later on. I met the guy who runs the network part of Dan's business, which was like 80% of his revenue. Okay. And he was the only guy not buying my product. He, and he's not a candidate for my product. They didn't buy storage. They bought and he said, I don't even know why I'm meeting with you. I said, oh, they thought I should meet with you. And, and we got in a culture discussion. He cancels his afternoon. And we had this talk. He said, this is our problem. And he invited himself to a dinner with the other guys. Now, the other four execs are guys that I am selling to. Okay. That's why I'm in. And prior to him, the dinner, I'm, I'm, I'm in a room with all these guys to talk, and Dan's there. And I said to him, exclusive of uh, pay, how do you show people you care? And they were like, it's like you asked them to square root of two. Right, 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 right. I'm like, how hard a question is that? And then the one guy goes, well, I don't think you can exclude pay. I said, your sprint, you don't pay that much to the start. It's what your average. If someone has a good year, what, what's the increase? 3%. So that means an average was like one. I said, do you deliver that on an email, a note on the chair in person? Note on the chair. You got 1%. Whoa. Jesus. So, so I'm like, oh, my God. I, can't, I see we have a problem. Here. Right. And so that guy comes to the dinner. And I knew that. These guys they were not self-aware at all. And he comes in on fire. He says, if you listen to his five points of culture, and I hadn't given them that talk. I was in. Uh -huh. some, I gave him some, and he recites, boom, boom, boom. When he goes to candor, this one guy goes, we're very candid. I say anything I want. <laughs> wow. I say anything I want to them. They can't say it to me. Donald Trump, I'm sure, assumes he's candid. Right, right, exactly. How about coming up this way? Probably not so right. well. <laughs> right, just, just saying. So candor is the ability to have people. So we said to ourselves, remember, we were a fast-growing company. We're going to be. I was well aware that the best ideas are not going to come from an executive suite. They're going to come from the people close to the customer. Mm. And you may launch a program. That sounds brilliant in a marketing meeting, and it right. makes no sense once we're rolling it out. Right. You want them to raise their hands. It just makes no sense. Right. We, they're not eating the dog food. And if it's a type of organization where candor is not rewarded, which is most, they're going to be quiet. They're going to let it go. They're going to let it fail. Mm. And then blame starts. Mm. And we were so fortunate so many times that someone raised their hand and said, hey, but if we did this? this. So I wanted... The main reason we wanted candor, when the day ended and they got on their bike, if they're on their bike, I want them thinking about the business and how they could help it. So when they would come in with ideas, we would have a discussion on anybody's ideas. I may say, hey, Chris, that's not going to happen. I remember one guy, why don't we, why don't we uh, uh, advertise on the Super Bowl? I'm like, hmm, what does that cost? I don't know. You don't know? No. 
you want us to advertise you don't know what it costs? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I said, okay, so it's three and a half million for 30 seconds. I said, um, what's our marketing budget? I don't know. Huh. Our global <laughs> marketing budget for years, 10 million. There so you if go. you had 10 million, would you put three and a half million for 30 seconds? It's only going to be seen in the United States. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. I said, so I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to come in with an idea, you should know the answers to questions like that. There you go. I didn't hear just to dump things on me. Right. right. But if you said to me, I know it costs this, I know our budget's that, and I think this is the right investment, we'd have a good talk. We could have a conversation, and he, right. In that same discussion, he came up with two other ideas. Second one, I said, I think it's a good idea. We can't do it. We don't have, we don't have the resource to do it now, but I believe we'll do it in the future. And the third one, and I don't recall what it is, obviously, but I remember thinking, that's that's an interesting idea. I said, well, how would you go about it? And he, he had thought it through well, because this is one he cared about, right? That right. was more of a throwaway. Right. And I said, well, how many people, how much could you accomplish in 90 days and 180 days? If I, if I funded at some level, what do you think? And he, he had an idea. And I said, how many people would it take? I said, I'll give you three people. And in the first 90 days, we'll do a checkpoint. And if it's going the way you say, I'll give you three more people and we'll do another checkpoint. And it was, and we had a phenomenal success. But the, the lesson there is if people, if you come up with an idea, you will attack it with a whole different passion. Right. And if I say to you, Chris, here's what you're doing tomorrow. Right. So one of our leadership styles is we're going to tell you what you have to accomplish. And we're going to tell you what the assets of the company are that you have to work with. And then you come up with the plan. Mm. Now, some people die in that environment, but the people that we hired and we looked for this in an interview thrived because they had never had that kind of freedom. Mm. They had never had someone back them. Right. And, and, and you know, there's no all right or all wrong way to do anything. You notice I said fence off the risk. Right. So if it's not going right, you didn't lose that much. But right. if people attack something they really care about, they'll shock you all the time. So candor was number two. Yep. And it saved our company, and, and it really was core to the culture. Wow. Everybody knew that they could say whatever, but they knew they should think, think about what they're saying because they're going to be challenged. Right, right. It's not just a free fall of ideas, right. but, but we had a lot of great programs that started ground level up. The third one, I wanted to make sure, now, if we had issues, I certainly wanted them to talk about it if they would come with a solution. Otherwise, right. it's called bitching. Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's very easy in a, you know, an open, open company to tell about what's wrong. Right, right. right. But more important to me was if somebody is giving you their heart and soul, you got to make sure they know you appreciate it. Okay. I made a phone call right before this today. I haven't worked at NetApp in a year and a half. And the guy said to me, a guy that I used to know at NetApp, and he's not, he was in professional services, got COVID, his whole family's got COVID. Oh, wow. That guy had called me or sent me a note on LinkedIn telling me this other fella had his 20th anniversary in the company and no one had called him. So I called him a couple wow. couple weeks ago, over a month wow. ago. And that guy called me to let me know this other fellow, unfortunately, he and his family have COVID. And I called him tonight. So this is the third point. I started a program called Catch. This is why they did it. This is why it got to me. Had okay. someone doing something right. And I said to our leaders back in 1995, a year after we started the company, because now I couldn't see everybody. At the beginning, I knew everybody was small. Right. And I said, if you see someone do something extraordinary to help our customer, to help our partners, to help society, one of the benefits, Chris, we gave every employee is one week off paid vacation if you'll work for a charity. Any charity you want. We don't want to dictate what you're passionate about. Go do it. No questions asked. We'd wow. love to have you write something up about what it meant to you and your family or your friends that you got to do it. We had people go down to Haiti. We had people, oh. uh, we had Dave Botterill up in Canada building an orphanage down in Mexico. Now he's in a lot of Haiti. Uh, so, but catch someone doing something right. So they would send me an email and I'd call and I'd, and I'd thank them. And I'd, it's like viral culture building because people never kept it a secret. Why did he call you? I did this, this, and this. There was a marketing woman in uh, Houston. This is probably 20 years ago. Okay. And I got a guy called me and he said, I got to tell you a story. We had two days of seminars. 
And usually the only time you know who ran that seminar is the coffee's cold, the food. <laughs> <laughs> ah, who is that? Who is that? <laughs> so he goes, so this woman that was running, I think her name was Shelly. Shelly, let's say Shelly. Um, he said, I saw a load in the car, I put the food at the end. He's thinking, man, that's pretty smart, bringing it home to her family. And then the second day she's doing it again, there's a lot of food after the event. And he walked over to her and he said, man, you must have a big family. She said, I'm bringing us down to a homeless shelter. I called her up and I said, you know what? This is why we're in business. Wow. This is the kind of impact. And it's not dictated by anybody. We're hiring people doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Right. right. But the fact that he took the time to call me allowed me to, to thank her. Right. And so catch someone doing something right morphed from, I told the leaders, but very soon it became peer to peer. And I want to tell you why I'm so proud of the person on my left and so proud of the person on my right. And then I married that with a concept, which was, it was when I was going to speak at uh, West Point. I spoke at Stanford on a Tuesday and West Point on a Thursday. At Stanford, I've been speaking at the Business School of Stanford since 1997. Okay. I'm very involved with Stanford. Which, which, which you're an alum of. Uh, yeah, I went there after the right. for okay. their exec program. But gotcha. They, they did a, a case, the longest running case studies on NetApp out there. I've been doing that case study, but Bill Barnett, who's a big guy at the business school, has asked me to come speak on culture and leadership. Okay. Because he said, these kids are not going to fail because they can't figure out a balance sheet. These are some smart right? people. <laughs> if they fail, it's because they couldn't get the culture part right. Exactly. I'm telling you, they get it. These kids, are, I call them kids, they're in it. 20s and right. 30s. Right. And they're going somewhere to Stanford Business School. Wow. So, and they get this point. My point is if people feel respected and appreciated, they'll do almost anything. Truly appreciated for what they do. But I, I married it with the concept on inspiration. This is what I remember. I was going to talk to these kids at West Point. It was the 43 cadets selected by the 4400 as the next great generation of leaders. Uh, the day before, they were in the White House with Secretary Gates, Secretary of Defense. And I was the first outside speaker they asked to come in and talk about culture. And I'm thinking, wow, it turns out they're all going to Afghanistan within, within 90 days. And this was in uh, 2009. It's on uh, YouTube if you're interested in okay. seeing the talk. And uh, just done by a, a phone. But um, I was thinking of the concept of inspiration. And it struck me, and I know this is correct, it's offered the most when it's needed the least. It's offered the least when it's needed the most. Right. When you've won the game, you beat Miami, 1988, a million people congratulated you. Of course, that felt great, but it wasn't inspirational after the first two or three. Right. But when you got hurt and you have a hurt leg and you're, and you're playing the game and the coaches come over and say, I know what you're going through. And your teammates clearly know what you're going through. I really appreciate it. Well, I said to people, I can't see that kind of stuff. If you know, so I was giving a talk in front of a large group of engineers at NetApp. And I said, if you know somebody who's a great NetApp employee, but they're struggling right now, mm. it could be we didn't give them the resources for the task at hand. Right. Let's say you're in sales, I overgold you. Uh, they could be having personal issues at home. Right. They could be having an illness issue. I don't, whatever the issue is, if you'll send me a note, I'll call them and, and tell them we care about them and I'll ask them if there's anything we can do. 1,500 calls on that one thing. So I had a break wow. of about 10 or 20 a day because there are about 500 people there and an average of three people each day. <clears throat> so it was one of the most inspiring things I ever did at NetApp for me because I got to call them all. I had a, there's a guy that has sold an incredible amount of product, number one guy in the history of the company, he never missed a goal. The one year he missed, I called him. His name's Mike. And I said, he's an executive there now. I said, Mike, you missed this year. You've never missed. He said, yeah. I said, can you tell me what happened? And he, he bet it all on one company. It was actually Apple and Steve Jobs said, we can't, we're can't. we not going to allow anything but Apple storage. And he had, he, had go, he had just cracked the account and had a big goal that year. And it went to zero. Right. Steve Jobs said, no more. And I said, is there something you would have done different? He said, no. Is there something I could do for you? He said, yeah. I said, what? He said, I want to give up all my accounts but Apple. I said, Mike, up till this moment, I thought you were very smart. <laughs> 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 what am I missing here? And he says, Tom, they're not going to be able to handle what the storage has. It's called I.O., how fast they okay. communicate. It was for iTunes. 
and it, it just done iTunes. This is in the nineties. And he said, if it fails, it'll be on the cover of every paper in the world. And Steve Jobs will say, put something in here that works. And if I'm not there, if I'm not everywhere, somebody wow. else will. And he has sold them more product than you can imagine. I think it's the wow. got the history of Netta. But the point is, with all the successes he's had, a success over time, he is said to be on many occasions the call he'll never forget oh. is when he was struggling. Wow. That's the call. So let's go back. We started with attitude, we started with candor. Now this is catch someone doing something right. right. We're gonna focus on the positive. I wanna make sure because I you can always deal with fixing things, but you, People don't say thank you enough. Right. The, for, the fourth point is leader, thoughts on leadership. And I, I brought up inspiration. I also bring up aspiration. Most people and most companies do not aspire high enough. Okay. And they'll never aspire higher than you as a leader. So you got to sometimes think about, are you aspiring higher enough in your life? I can tell you when you look back at your life, you'll never regret something you did that didn't work. You'll regret things you didn't go for. And so aspiration, I've always pushed myself to make sure I'm aspiring high enough. And, and one of my management styles, which I learned from Don Valentine, was when things are going poorly for some, or people are struggling, and it, it, they're doing the right thing, they're struggling, I'm very supportive. When people are really doing well is when I, when I inject tension. Okay. Because you'll say, you know, I just... I just bowled a one. I just bowled a two forty. What stopped you from a two eighty? Right. <laughs> <laughs> what, right. Whatever it is, why couldn't you have done better? Uh huh. And you know what? I've had people break through barriers. You set a barrier. You were thinking I could get to here. When you got to here real fast, you kind of gear down because right. you're going to get. Right. Well, why not there? Right. Why not? And we took a company to the moon thinking that way. So, uh. so aspiration, and then so that's. Leadership is a whole diff is a is a whole topic, but I, I just think don't ask people to do things you wouldn't do. Make sure you lead from the front, you know, and, and make sure that they know that you're you're there. Your goal in life is to make them successful, and then they'll come back. And then the last thing is just embracing change. You're either getting better, or you're getting worse. Okay. And if you if you stay in the same, you're getting worse. And John, I hired John Cotter when I was at NetApp. John was. Well, the world is the world's leading expert on change. I believe he's at Harvard, and he's written many, many books. He's the most published uh, author ever at Harvard Business School. Okay. In the uh, Harvard Business Review, I mean, and he says that eighty percent of companies, and I think this is probably true of people too, that set out to change fail. Eighty percent. He said, "I'm being low on that because I don't want everybody to get turned off." And why is that? Because they can't sustain a sense of urgency. You think about someone you really change is because your hair's on fire, right. maybe, maybe a health issue, and you say, oh, right. my God, now i got to get... He said, and later on he realized the reason they can't sustain urgency is it's set up on the wrong parameter. Most companies set up urgency around what he called a burning platform. If you don't do this, we're screwed. If we don't do this, right. you're okay. screwed. Okay. Well, now you have urgency. Right, right. But over time, that's going to... So what is the alternative to that? What's the big opportunity? And as a leader, you need to take people through. We're going to go through this pain because we come to the other side. Uh -huh. It's going to look like that. That's why we're going to do it. You have to be able to and mean it and give it enough thought. What is the big opportunity? Why are we changing? Right. You don't change to change. We need to change so we can come out here and people will do amazing things to get out the other side. When you came in 1987, Notre Dame was not so good, right? And Lou Holtz said, we got to go over this hill. Right. In 1988, he wrote a letter to you guys said, we're not going to lose again to the seniors. But you guys went through all kinds of stuff because you believed in what could happen mm -hmm. on the other side. Last, last point on this thing, and I don't know how much time we have, but best question I've ever been asked, the West Point. Hand goes up right at the end. Unfortunately, they didn't capture this on the, uh, the little video. Ah, oh, okay. And he said, sir, he says, how many employees were at NetApp when you were there, when you joined? I said, 32. And he smiled. He said, all the people you're speaking to here, the 43 people, 
I think 25% were women. This is back in 2009. I think they're going to okay. be the next great generational leaders of West Point. I was very impressed. But he said, uh, the people you're speaking to are all going to be in Afghanistan within 90 days, 22 years old, leading 32 people. That's a unit. And he says, and whether they live or die will depend upon the decisions we make. Wow. He said, what's your advice for us? Cloud computing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> it was so far away from. Oh, my God. For a living. Right. And I'll never forget. I said to him, uh, well, first of all, I've never walked in your shoes. And I hope that you don't have to keep walking. Think about it. that. was 2009, 2020. We're still having nice right. ideas. But I said, but I'll tell you something. 32 people is not a lot of people. And the people listening to this podcast, if you are leading people, you're probably, most of you are not leading more than 32 people. You should know what their hopes, dreams, and aspirations are. Mm. They do. Wow. And if, wow. If you know what their hopes, their dreams, and their aspirations, and you can ask them. And if I asked you that and you give me some thought, you can tell me what they are. Right. And now if I make that my goal to make sure that you have an opportunity to after your hopes, dreams, and aspirations, we are connected. So that's number one. And number two, don't ask them to do anything you wouldn't do. Mm. And then the last one I said, if it's become, if it's between you coming home alive and them coming home alive, they got to know they're going home. And they were dead silence, I'd say, for seven or eight seconds. They stood up as a group, saluted, and oh walked my out. God. It was unbelievable. Dude, I got the chills. That's amazing. <laughs> it was a cool moment. Wow. It was a moment I'll never forget. Bernie Banks ran leadership at West Point, and he now runs it at Kellogg in Chicago. Phenomenal guy. But oh. If you ever want to meet him, he's in Chicago. Awesome. Awesome. He's a spectacular guy. Hey. Uh, but he said to me later, that's something we'll talk about for a while here. That is amazing. Gosh. Well, it's been, I want to respect your time. Okay. Uh, Tom, this has been awesome. Um, I'm not going to tell you, we, we, we had a chance to go a couple minutes over, so I do apologize about that. Yeah, no but problem. I mean, I, I, I wanted to kind of allow folks to kind of hear what made you the person you are. And I think that we had a chance to, to learn about that. But a little bit more important than that, I think we had a chance to, to see why people want to listen to you about changing culture, about leadership. So thank you very much about that. Sure. Um, one last thing. I know you're a voracious reader. Can you give me uh, what book you're reading right now or what book that you would like um, folks maybe to, to pick up and read if they have time? Uh, that, for me, Chris, it changes all the time by kind of what what's going on in my life and what I feel like reading. Okay. A uh, book I just, I read a lot of history. So I, I don't read business books, which kind of surprises business right. people, I guess. I read well-written history okay. that, uh, that inspires me. It has to be well-written. So it's not uh, this happened that date, but, but it's, a, it's the story. I had, I've done, read a ton about World War II, and I, I was on how did we get in that conflict? What, what really happened in the conflict? Okay. One of the best books I've ever read, a series of books, was Winston Churchill's uh, volumes on World War II, which he wrote in 1947, got the Nobel Prize. Wow, okay. Uh, so... And then one of the best biographies I've ever read is of McCullough uh, Truman. And so okay. that's a period you don't really know about, the 40s. But I, there's a book uh, called The 50s by uh, David Halberstam. And it, it having the 50s were a period nobody ever studies because, you know, everybody knows civil rights and everything. In the 60s, right. you know World War II happened. Right. But I really was impacted by that book. And I read it for a second time recently, because it connects so many things that set up what happened later. You had Korean War, Truman, and Eisenhower's thing with Joe McCarthy, which is right. similar to what's going on. Right. You had Eisenhower putting down the freeways, which m mobilized America, so no one wanted to fund an infrastructure bill. He fought his own party to get it done. Uh. You had the beginning of civil rights. You had Elvis come in with rock and roll, which was a rebellion thing, ending up into the Sputnik with the space race. Right. But so many things that happened in the 60s made sense because if you understand the 50s. Interesting. So I read a lot of things about great men like Churchill. 
um, there's there's a uh, The Devil in the White City by Larson. He has a book. I, I, I can't think of the name. It's off the top of my head. I just started it. Okay. But it's about Winston Churchill in the first year of the, of the Blitz. And it's incredible how he inspired those people to go through that Blitz. I mean, other countries were given up. When France fell, it looked like it's just about right. the first year. Right. Can't think of it. But Devil in the White City is written by Larson, which is a great book centered okay. on Chicago. I don't know if you know the story. It's a murder mystery, but it, up until that 1896, St. Louis was the center of the Midwest, and that it moved when they put the World's Fair in Chicago. And this book is a great book about how that okay. happened, why, why Chicago became the center of the Midwest. But the author is Eric Larson. Okay. And this book on Churchill, uh, it, it's just intriguing. It, it's a very well, it makes you think about his mind and you know, he, how he kept himself motivated when, if he had given up, it was over. Uh, one guy. So wow. I, those are the kind of books. Those are the kind of books I read. Books like Unbroken by Laura Hildebrandt. Okay. Unbroken is a, a phenomenal book. She also wrote Sea Biscuit, which was a phenomenal book. I didn't think the movie was that good. She was a shut in. She never saw a horse race yet. The book is about Sea Biscuit during the, the 1930s when radio, right. everybody listened to radio. Right. Adolf Hitler, uh, Roosevelt. And Churchill and Seabiscuit were the most talked about names and everything. Seabiscuit was smaller than all the other horses. Wow. Rose up to beat the biggest horse in the planet. Uh, brilliant book, but unbroken. If you want an inspirational book like Boys in the Boat, it's unbroken. Okay. Unbroken. Perfect. Un by Laura Hildebrand. Perfect. All right. Top. Hey, man, this is great. Um, I, I, I'm excited because I, I want to do this again some some other time, sure. maybe after we win the national championship, something like that. <laughs> where we decide we're going to meet up here. But uh, last take, what what's your take? What's your feeling about what the ACC just did by announcing that Notre Dame is already in uh, in, in the well, ACC championship? I, I think Dabo Sweeney caused this because Dabo Sweeney said, "I'm not going back to Florida State." So that threw the Gauntlet down. I'm not going to play on the 12th. Right. And I think Notre Dame's position was, we're happy to play Wake Forest on the 12th, but we should not have a game that last week. And they have an out. And I happened to listen to Rick Neuheisel, who's a friend of mine on yesterday. Okay. And he was making the point that one of those things should change. Either Notre Dame should not have to play, right. or Clemson should have to play. It's a makeup game for COVID. Right. They had COVID on their team. Right. We have a makeup game against Wake Forest. Right. One of you shouldn't have one team have to play and have and the other team have two weeks off. You, mm -hmm. you have an exposure to COVID and injuries for that other team. That, yeah. Right. And so I think the, the ACC did it for that reason. And I think they were selfish to say, this is our chance to have two teams in the playoffs. Okay. I'm not so thrilled about that. I right. think that if there was no COVID, and th this, then it would, it would have been a stupid thing. Right. Then you are doing it just for that reason. Right. Remember, Dabo just said, "I'm not going back to Florida State. Yeah. I'm not doing it." Yeah. So now I was, I, I was, I was surprised about that one. Well, I was and he, in that league, yeah, he runs that league. As oh, a well, absolutely. Well, I think last year he said that, and, and this was kind of a controversy when they were talking about, you know, I mean, how strong is ACC outside of you? And he flat out said, "Look, you know, we're the best team." And we're getting punished because we're in, we're, we're winning our conference year in and year out, and we're being punished by saying, okay, well, if, if the college football playoff committee, if they're looking at better teams and wins, then, yeah, so he, he, he definitely runs that conference. I'm just saying, Swafford did not want to go against Dabo. Yeah. Because that would have been the easy decision. You both right. play. But right. I think then they said, wait a minute, if neither of them play, yeah, I mean, if I'm the University of Miami, I'm pissed off because... They had a chance if either of them lost. Right, right? exactly, exactly. But yeah, exactly, I think I I don't think it had anything to do with they were trying to help Notre Dame. They they want two teams in the playoff, and that's their easiest way to get there. Yeah, so. yeah. All right, thank uh, you, Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for this. Has been an amazing, amazing interview, Tom. Thank you. I like to thank everybody watching on Facebook and YouTube Live, and most of all, I like to thank my wonderful wife and daughter, who is my production team. They did a phenomenal job, even though we had a couple of technical difficulties in the beginning. Hey, you um, got to work it, man. <laughs> you got to work through it, right? This podcast, along with others, are on my YouTube page at Chris Zorix 50 If you like what you, what you see, please press subscribe. Again, thank you so much, Tom. This has been awesome. My you, pleasure. You did a phenomenal job. 
Thank you so much, and go Irish. Go Irish. You got it, bud. Take care, buddy.